my lover is a woman and when i hold her feel her warmth i feel good feel safe then i never think of my family's voices never hear my sisters say bulldaggers queers funny come see us but don't bring your friends well welcome everyone bienvenidos what a wonderful may day for us to all be together to celebrate poetry and community and fabulous, fabulous voices coming together. You have made it to the one and only the collectibles lesbian trading card reading series, amplifying the voices of LBTQ writers and featuring the poets of Headmistress Press's fabulous lesbian trading card series, which is the vision of the extraordinary Mary Miriam and Risa Denenberg, and including today's incredible live open mic to follow our featured reader. Well, how absolutely special it is today to be able to welcome J.P. Howard. There's your book, J.P., signed copy, of po who is today's poet of praise. I love to say that poet of praise, sharing her work and the work of one of her poets of influence, the unparalleled Pat Parker. Oh my gosh. I, I've known about the entire reading series, you know, in advance. And every month, I just feel like the crescendo keeps, you know, the wave keeps building. And I've been waiting for this one for many, many months. And the day has finally arrived. Well, before I introduce our two featured poets today via their cards, of course. I want to remind you that you can purchase the trading cards as well as all Headmistress Press titles at the Headmistress Press website, which we will share periodically in the chat during today's live program. And with a reminder that we are live and the chat is live. So send your appreciation in droves to today's featured reader and our wonderful open mic poets, Sarah Youngblood Gregory, El Ilana Dykewoman, Mary Oishi, and Yeva Johnson. All will share their spectacular work with us following JP's uh, performance featuring Pat Parker. Well, every month, folks, um, as your host, and I'm Sandy, you know, an author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry, I have the best seat in the house in the Zoom room to introduce poets of consequence and conscience. And today, I could not be um, more privileged or honored to introduce J.P. Howard, a poet whom I first began following after I heard her read from her from her debut, from her collection, Say Mira, Mirror, Poems and Histories at the very first Headmistress Press that I ever attended. It was an off-site event in Washington, DC, and it was very off-site. It was quite a journey to get to this fabulous bookstore in one of the, one of the uh, venues in DC and uh, not only was JP there that evening reading, but also last month's features, Jessica Jacobs and Nicole Brown were two of the other features. So it was quite an event um, that evening in Washington, DC. Well, JP's work has never left my side since. And I am overjoyed that from time to time, we get to share space and community, particularly at the Literary Salon, 
that that she co-hosts and has been doing for 10 years, I confirmed today. So happy 10th anniversary. Um, Women Right in Bloom out of Brooklyn. And she brings together the most extraordinary women's voices of power and spirit. And if you have not been part of that, um, of, of, of that experience that inspires and encourages people from all over the world, join. Uh, I really want to encourage you to try to attend one of those. Well, let's go right to J.P. Howard's card here. And as I like to mention, it is card 34. J.P. Howard is an educator, literary activist, curator, and community builder extraordinaire. That's, you didn't write extraordinary in your bio, but I- You added that, you added that, added that. Yeah, I added that. Her debut poetry collection, Say Mirror, from the operating system was a Lambda literary finalist. She is also the author of Bury Your Love Poems Here from Belladonna Books and co-editor of Sinister Wisdom Journals, Black Lesbians, We Are the Revolution, Praise This Complicated, her story, legacy, healing, and revolutionary poems, a chapbook length collection of poems that is part of a larger collaborative project and is forthcoming from Harlequin Creature in 2021. JP was a featured author in Lambda Literary's LGBTQ Writers in Schools program and is featured in the Lesbian Poet Trading Card Series. Here it is, card 34 with Headmistress Press. She has received fellowships and grants from Cave Canem, Vona, Lambda Literary, the Astria Lesbian Foundation, and the Brooklyn Arts Council. She curates Women Writers in Bloom Poetry Salon, a monthly New York-based literary salon series, series that currently meets online. And I know you're very much looking forward to when you are all back together in person. Her poetry and essays have appeared in the Slow Down Podcast, Academy of American Poets, Apogee Journal, and Split This Rock, amongst many, many others. JP's poetry is widely anthologized, and JP is a general poetry editor for Women's Studies Quarterly and is the editor at large of Mom Egg Review and Vox Online. And of course, please visit her website to check in with all the extraordinary things that she is doing all the time. Well, I'm going to also introduce to you JP's poet of influence, Pat Parker. Pat Parker, 1944 to 1989, was born in Houston, Texas into a working class black family. In 1962, she moved to California, earning a bachelor's degree at LA City College and a master's at San Francisco State College. She was twice married to men, but came out as a lesbian in the late 1960s, where she faced violence in her first marriage and later a sister was murdered by her ex-husband. Unsurprisingly, domestic abuse was a theme in Pat Parker's poetry, best voiced in her book, Woman's Slaughter from 1978. Parker was deeply influenced and involved in feminist and anti-racist movements. And along with Judy Gron and other feminist writers, she founded the Women's Press Collective where her works were first published. The cadence of Parker's poems resonate when read aloud, and she was known as a tremendously charismatic and powerful reader. She produced four additional poetry collections, Child of Mind, 1972, Pit Stop, 1975, Movement in Black, 1978, and Jonestown and Other Madness from 1985. 
Parker was a director at the Feminist Women's Health Center in Oakland, California from 1978 to 1978, 1987. And sadly, that's an underestimate, uh, underestimated word. She died of breast cancer and is survived by her life partner, Marty Dunham and her two daughters. Well, would you please welcome J.P. Howard, bringing forward the voice of the inimitable Pat Parker. Thank you, J.P. Thank you, Sandy. That was beautiful, beautiful introduction. So good to always hear about Pat Parker. And so much thanks to Headmistress Press, to Risa, to Mary, and of course, our fabulous host, Sandy, who's looking so sharp in the top hat, which I love. <laughs> It's uh, so great to be in community with everybody. I see um, a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. So this is really wonderful. Um, let me, I'm gonna try to start with a screen share because um, Pat Parker, I always reference her as my um, ancestor poet, my ancestor poet muse. And I would say almost like 99.9% .9 of every poetry reading I do, um, I mention a quote of hers, um, which is something to the effect of uh, something that she said was, the day that I can bring all the parts of myself along with me, I would have what I would call a revolution. Um, and that is something that really, I think, guides how I walk through the world, um, guides how I parent, guides literally every, everything I do, my poetry, my, my job outside of uh, you know, poetry. Um, and I think that's so important, so transformative when I read those words of hers and, and the um, edition of Sinister Wisdom that I uh, did edit, co-edit, Black Lesbians, We Are the Revolution, was really based on that quote. Um, it came from that, you know, the day that we can bring all the parts of ourselves, right, to the table, to the, to the stage, to our jobs, no matter where we go, right, um, that's, that is a revolution. Um, and you certainly you think about that today, still true, even though it was true whenever, you know, the time that she said it. Um, so, so much, you know, that resonates with me so much. And I discovered her work early on um, when I was in college at Barnard. I was a women's college and um, discovered her work around the same time that I discovered the work of Cheryl Clark and Audre Lorde. Um, and so that was really empowering to discover their work at a, at a time where I knew that I was a lesbian, but I hadn't yet come out. Um, I was an only child, uh, had grown up uh, at a very sort of, um, what's the word, sort of sheltered life. Um, because I was an only child, I came from a long history of only children. My mom was an only child. My grandmother was an only child. My family had migrated from the deep south up to Sugar Hill, Harlem. So I grew up in Sugar Hill, Harlem. Um, and we were very, very close. Um, but of course I hadn't yet come out until I started to read the words of Pat Parker. And I was like, wait a minute, he or she is, she can write about loving women, you know, and she can embrace that, you know, sort of publicly. And then discovering the words of Orchie Park and Cheryl Clark at the same time, it was just really sort of mind blowing. And I'm like, you know what, they can do this and they're still alive. You know, they can sort of tell their truth and speak their truth. And so that really, um, really empowered me to, to sort of come out um, at that particular point in time and have sort of never turned back. So let me try to find this a little, it's basically a little tiny, mini, mini, mini uh, essay that Poets Org had asked me to write about a poet that influenced me. And of course, who do I write about? But Pat Parker. So let's say we're gonna try this. Um, hopefully I can share. Okay, and I'm just gonna read it. Um, hopefully you can also see it. Um, so this was, I was reading about Pat Parker's My Lover as a Woman, which I, which I uh, think I'm going to be reading today as well. Pat Parker was one of the first Black lesbian poets whose poetry I discovered while attending Barnard College. I was a young, closeted Black lesbian, and her poems were empowering and life-altering. Parker spoke directly to me when she discussed the beauty of loving another woman. My lover is a woman, and when I hold her, feel her warmth, I feel good, feel safe. Her poems of gay pride, political activism, and her open, unapologetic love of women gave me courage to come out to my own family. A beloved only child, the first in my family to attend college, raised by my Southern grandmother and mother in Harlem. I naively expected their support when I came out to them in college. I was heartbroken when my grandma Pearl responded in disgust, I can't believe my grandbaby is a damn bull dagger. Parker's brutally honest stanza mirrored my own experience in the black family. I never think of my family's voices. I never hear my sister say, bull daggers, queers, funny, come see us, but don't bring your friend. Discovering Parker's bold, unflinching voice helped prepare me for many uphill battles as an out queer black woman, not just in society, but at times in my own family and community. 
Um, and so that really, you know, her, her words really spoke to me. And of course, my grandmother saying that, because like I said, it was a very, it's a very small family. We were all only children. So for her to say that really sort of shocked me. Um, but I stayed out, didn't, certainly didn't make me go back in the closet. And we ultimately, you know, sort of um, all worked out our relationships. You know, it took, it took a little bit of time to kind of get over that. Um, but reading, reading her poems and the fact that she was so political, the fact that she was, you know, an activist, um, was something that really sort of influenced me. I know that she was a mom and even at that young age, maybe I was what, 19 or whatever, you know, when this happened, I always knew that, you know, somehow I wanted children, you know, and this is not the time where we knew about, you know, uh, uh, queer families having, having families, right? But I knew that I still wanted to be a parent. So the fact that she also wrote about, you know, being a parent, so many things that she wrote about really, really resonated with me. Um, if you don't have her, any of her collections, I definitely recommend, I know, you know, I keep holding it up and I'll hold it up one more time. <laughs> probably a couple times. And so this is the complete works of Pat Parker, um, introduction by Judy Gron and edited by the amazing Julie R. Enza, um, who's a dear friend of mine. Um, so this is really an amazing, amazing collection. And the, the reason why I think it's so important to me is that it was so hard for me to find her poems, right? As, as time went on, because a lot of her poetry was out of print. And so it's really because of of, of this, you know, edition of Sinister Wisdom and Sapphic Classics that they kind of brought it back. And so to me, this has been so important. I was able to host a, an event with my salon that featured some really fabulous black lesbian uh, poets who read this when it first came out, you know, a couple, a couple years back. So it's important to, you know, keep, keep our voices alive, right? Um, and this really tells me that by, you know, Julie and Sapphic Classics deciding to put her words back in print, to me was very empowering. You know, it, it spoke to me a lot. Um, I'm definitely gonna read some poems from here and let's see. So the other book I wanted to recommend actually, so before I forget, and some of you probably hopefully have read it, is Sister Love, The Letters of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, 1974 to 1989. Also by Sapphic Classics, Julie's amazing, also edited by Julie Enzer. Um, and if you haven't read any of their letters between poets uh, Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, please, please get this book. They first met in 1969, and I love that they began exchanging letters regularly five years later. And so this book, this other book I just mentioned, it really sort of tracks their relationship over the next 15 years. Um, and they share their ideas, their advice, their confidences, literally through the mail, right? We didn't have email back then. And so they were actually writing these letters over the years and they were living in very different places sometimes. And they would send these handwritten typewritten letters and postcards. Um, and sometimes they would insert articles. Um, and one of the letters, I love this, Audrey Lord, um, sends Pat Parker some extra money that she had made from a you know, poetry reading. And she basically says, if you can't use this, you know, pass it on, give it to a, you know, another, another sister poet, right? Um, and so I love that idea of community and poetry and women supporting each other. And if you read these letters, you're gonna see that. Um, and they discussed their work as writers. Um, they shared intimate details of their lives because they were both struggling and dealing with cancer, right? Um, and so it's basically this amazing opportunity to sort of like glimpse into the lives of these two powerhouse poets, feminists, activists, black lesbians, um, and really just amazing poets. So if you have a chance, definitely, you know, definitely be that. I was really, really moved by it. Uh, I've been on a couple of panels having the opportunity to talk about it, thanks to Julie. Um, so those are kind of things that I would say are, are really seminal works to read if you want to get to know more about um, Pat Parker, if you want to get to know about, more about her relationship with Audre Lorde, I definitely recommend, recommend those. Um, so let's see, um, what do I want to read to start with? Um, so I'm going to start with some, oh, you know what, I'm actually going to start with something that was, a, I think, a quote from hers, right? This is an interview that Parker um, did, and she had said this. Uh, this is in Ashe, a journal for Black lesbians, which was a uh, a journal that was back, um, oh, I knew about it certainly in the 1980s when I went to California. So um, this might've been when she wrote about it. Uh, and it's, she said this, if I die tomorrow and what could be said about my life is yes, she wrote books and she wrote poetry and people liked it, that would not be enough. That's not why I take the risk that I do. A woman wrote a letter to me and the most touching thing she said was, I'm doing my work so you don't have to do it for me. What she's telling me by this is long after I'm gone, there are going to be women who will continue to do the work. And that really resonates with me, right? We have to continue to do the work. Um, I think she was very much you know, aware of that. Um, and then let me read a little bit of an introduction to um, her book, Movement in Black, which I think was her third book. And it was actually an introduction by Audre Lorde. Um, and I just love sort of anything that gives us insight into their like amazing um, relationship. 
And she says in this introduction, now with love and admiration, I introduce Pat Parker and this new collection of her poetry. These poems would not need any introduction except for the racism and heterosexism of poetry establishment, which has whited out Parker from the recognition deserved by a dynamic and original voice in our poetry today. I am a child of America, a stepchild raised in a back room. Even when a line falters, Parker's poetry maintains, reaches out, does not let go. It is clean and sharp without ever being neat. I love that quote. And that comes up a lot in her work. It is clean and sharp without ever being neat. Yet her images are precise and the plain accuracy of her visions encourages an honesty that may be uncomfortable as it is compelling. Her words are womanly and uncompromising. Sister, your foot smaller, but is still on my neck. Her tenderness is very direct. A woman's body must be taught to speak, bearing a lifetime of keys, a patient soul, and her directness can be equally tender. My hands are big and rough and callous like my mother's. Her black woman's voice rings true and deep and gentle with an iron echo. It is merciless and vulnerable and far ranging. In her poems, Parker owns her weaknesses. She owns her strength. She does not give up. Even when she weeps, her words evoke the real power, which is core born. A pit is an abyss. Let's drink to my shame. For as a black lesbian poet, Parker knows that for all women, the most enduring conflicts are from simple. And for the sisters who still think that fear is a reason to be silent, Parker's poetry proudly, loudly and clearly says, I have survived, I see and I speak. Um, and I think I, you know, I, that's what I discovered about her work at that young age, you know, and it was like, she's speaking her truth. She's speaking her truth to all of us. She is not afraid of anything. Um, so let me just, uh, you know, share some of the poems here. Okay. You can't be sure of anything these days. You meet a really far out man, tells you he's been on his own for years, opens car doors for you, carries packages for you, protects you from evil doers, says he wants an intelligent, creative woman to be his partner in life. You marry and find the dude is too weak to pick up a dish, too dumb to turn on a burner, too afraid to do laundry, too tense to iron a shirt. And to top the whole thing off, he tries to cover his incompetence by telling you it's women's work. You can't be sure of anything these days. Speak, Pat, speak. <laughs> All right. Um, this is, and some of her poems are uh, untitled. And that was something that sometimes people gave her a little bit of grief about, you know, people who, you know, were sort of formalists, you know, um, but I think all her poetry is powerful, but it is something she definitely, you know, dealt with, with people sometimes, you know, making comments that they thought maybe the poems were, were too plain or too straightforward. Um, but I, I just see them all as powerful. My hands are big and rough and callous like my mother's. My innards are twisted and torn and sectioned like my father's. Now, some of my sisters see me as big and twisted, rough and torn, callous and sectioned, definitely not pleasant to be around. Had I listened to my father, I would be married and miserable, dreaming of fish and open space and bellowing my needs, waiting for someone to listen to the second run and know. It is difficult to be strong and appear sure. No one ever believes when you cry. Um, and this next one, she just has a, a little quote at the top. Uh, how do we know that the Panthers will accept a gift from white middle-class women? Have you ever tried to hide in a group of women, hide yourself, slide between floorboards, slide yourself away, child, away from this room and your sister before she notices your black self and her white mind, slide your eyes down away from other blacks afraid a meeting of eyes and pain would travel between you, change like milk to buttermilk, a silent rage. Sister, your foot's smaller, but it's still on my neck. All right, and this one is called To My Vegetarian Friend. It's not called soul food because it goes with music. It's a survival food. From the Greece sprang generations of my people, generations of slaves that ate the leavings of their masters and survived. And when I sit faced by chitlins and greens, neck bones and tails, it is a ritual. It is a joining me to my ancestors and your words ring untrue. This food is good for me. 
it replenishes my soul. So if you really can't stand to look at my food, can't stand to smell my food and can't keep those feelings to yourself, do us both a favor and stay home. All right, all right. This one um, is a really powerful one. And if you know her work, a lot of you may have heard this one. Uh, this one, uh, and actually, you know what? I don't think it has a title either, but you'll, uh, for people who know her work, you'll probably recognize it. Boots are being polished, trumpeteers, clean their horns, chains and locks forge. The crusade has begun. Once again, flags of Christ are unfurled in the dawn and cries of soul saviors sing apocalyptic on airwaves. Citizens, good citizens all parade into voting booths and in self-righteous sanctity, X away our right to life. I do not believe as some that the vote is an end. I fear even more, it is just the beginning. So I must make assessment, look to you and ask, where will you be when they come? They will not come a mob rolling through the streets, but quickly and quietly move into our homes and remove the evil, the queerness, the faggotry, the perverseness from their midst. They will not come clothed in brown and swastikas or bearing chests heavy with gleaming crosses. The time and need for ruses are over. They will come in business suits to buy your homes and bring bodies to fill your jobs. They will come in robes to rehabilitate and white coats to subjugate. And where will you be when they come? Where will you all be when they come? And they will come. They will come because we are defined as opposite, perverse. And we are perverse every time we watched a queer hassled in the streets and said nothing. It was an act of perversion. Every time we lied about the boyfriend or girlfriend at coffee break, it was an act of perversion. Every time we heard, I don't mind gays, but why must they be blatant and said nothing? It was an act of perversion. Every time we let a lesbian mother lose her child and did not fill the courtrooms, it was an act of perversion. Every time we let straights make out in bars while we couldn't touch because of laws, it was an act of perversion. Every time we put on the proper clothes to go to a family wedding and left our lovers at home, it was an act of perversion. Every time we heard who I go to bed with is my personal choice, is personal, not political, and said nothing, it was an act of perversion. Every time we let our straight relatives bury our dead and push our lovers away, it was an act of perversion. And they will come, they will come for the perverts, and it won't matter if you're homosexual, not a faggot, lesbian, not a dyke, gay, not queer. It won't matter if you own your business, have a good job or, or an SSI. It won't matter if you're black, Chicano, Native American, Asian or white. It won't matter if you're from New York or Los Angeles, Galveston or Sioux Falls. It won't matter if you're butch or femme, not into roles, monogamous, not monogamous. It won't matter if you're Catholic, Baptist, atheist, Jewish or MCC, they will come. They will come to the cities and to the land, to your front rooms and in your closets. They will come for the perverts. And where will you be when they come? Such a powerful piece, right? So powerful. And to me, her, her words continue to, main, to remain relevant and timely, right? Um, even though these were written, you know, um, some decades ago. Oh, and she also had a great sense of humor, I feel like. Um, so this one, a lot of you might know, but we'll see. When I make love to you, I cry with each stroke of my tongue to say, I love you, to tease, I love you, to hammer, I love you, to melt, I love you. And your sounds drift down, oh God, oh Jesus. And I think here it is, some dudes getting credit for what a woman has done again. <laughs> Get a great sense of humor too. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me come to you naked. Come without my mask, come dark and lay beside you. Let me come to you old, come as a dying snail, come weak and lay beside you. Let me come to you angry, come shaking with hate, come callous and lay beside you. Even more, let me come to you strong, come sure and free, come powerful and lay with you. Uh, Pente, excuse me, sorry folks over here. Um, hente, it's difficult to explain a good feeling. My world has become colorful, a rainbow of hues, and now a part of my living. And it feels good. It feels good to listen to people talk about the streets, 
and know it's not a vicarious experience. It feels good to sit and be loose, to talk about worry about the racists in the room. It feels good to hear we're gonna have a party and know it's really gonna be a party. It feels good to be able to say my sisters and not have any reservations. But best of all, it feels good to sit in a room and say, have you ever felt like, and somebody has. Um, oh, this one, I think I remember reading this. I can make you, I remember reading this one, the next one, uh, many years ago. And um, I don't know, it's, I feel like it's, it still speaks to me. It spoke to me then. Love isn't. I wish I could be the lover you want, come joyful, bear brightness like summer sun. Instead, I come cloudy, bring pregnant women with no money, bring angry comrades with no shelter. I wish I could take you, run over beaches, lay you on sand and make love to you. Instead, I come rage, bring city streets with wine and blood, bring cops and guns with dead bodies in prison. I wish I could take you, travel to new lives, kiss niños on tourist buses, sip tequila at sunrise. Instead, I come sad, bring lesbians without lovers, bring sick folk without doctors, bring children without families. I wish I could be your warmth, your blanket. All I can give is my love. I care for you. I care for our world. If I stop caring about one, it would only be a matter of time before I stop loving the other. Um, and I think that spoke to me so much because um, I ended up going into public uh, interest law. And so I just thought about, you know, how much of like all the different parts of our lives kind of affect us, right? You know, how we're kind of working with community and, and ended up doing that, you know, for pretty much, I mean, I was young when I first read this and it was before I had done that. Um, but I think maybe that's why it resonated to me, kind of having that. And I know that she very much worked with community, was very much dedicated, you know, to community. Um, and just get, you really get that sense of that in some of her poems. Um, and this other poem is another one. So it was so cool to be able to prepare for this and kind of it took me back, you know, all those years ago when I first discovered her, her work and um, how much it meant to me to discover them and then to see how relevant it, you know, it appears now, especially with hindsight, right? You know, now having, you know, sort of grown up and, and being able to look back and have life experience. Um, and so this is one of those poems too. And I guess this is for, uh, you know, for, this might resonate with folks, my brother for Blackberry. It is a simple ritual, phone rings, Barry's voice, low husky, what you doing? Not a thing, you coming over? Well, I thought I'd come by, a simple ritual. He comes, we eat, watch television, play cards, play video games. Some nights he sleeps over, others he goes home. Sometimes he brings a friend, more often he doesn't. A simple ritual. It is a pause that alerts me, tells me this time it's hard time. The pain has risen to the waterline. We rarely verbalize, there is no need. Within this lifestyle, there is so much to undo you. Hey, look at the faggot. When I was a child, our paper boy was clawed. Every day, seven days a week, he bared the Texas weather. The rain that never stopped walked through the black section where sidewalks had not yet been invented and ditches filled with water. Walk careful, Claude, across the plank that serves as sidewalk sometimes tips into the murky water or heat, wet heat that covers your pores, cascades rivulets of stringing sweat down your body. Our paper boy, Claude, bared the weather well. Each day he came and each Saturday at dusk, he would come to collect. My parents, like Claude, each Saturday Claude, polite, would come, always said thank you, whether we had the money or not. Each Saturday, my father would say, Claude is such a nice boy, works hard, goes to church, gives money to his mother. And each Sunday we would go to church and there would be Claude and his choir robe till the Sunday when he didn't come. Hey, look at the faggot. Some young men howled at him, ran in a pack, reverted to some ancient form. They took Claude, took his money, yelled faggot as they cast his body in front of a car. How many cars have you dodged, Barry? How many ancient young men have you met? Perhaps your size saved you, but then you were not always this size. Perhaps your fleetness, perhaps there are no more ancient young men. Ah, within this lifestyle we have chosen. Sing, what do you mean you wanna be a singer? Best get a good government job, maybe sing on the side. You heard the words, be responsible, be respectable, be stable, be secure, be normal boy. How many quarter filled rooms have you sang your soul to then washed away with blended whiskey? 
I took my booking agent one year. I told my booking agent one year, book me a tour. Blackberry and I will travel this land together. Take our black queerness into the space of this place and say, hey, here we are, a faggot and a dyke, black. We make good music and write good poems. We be something else. My agent couldn't book us. It seemed my le lesbian audiences were not ready for my faggot brother. And I remembered a law conference in San Francisco where women who loved women threw booze and tomatoes at a woman who dared to have a man in her band. What is this world we have? Is my house the only safe place for us? And I enraged all the low paying gigs, all the uncut records, all the dodge, dodge cars, all the fear escaping, all the unclaimed love. So I could offer my bosom and food and shudder, fearful of the time when it will not be enough, fearful of the time when the ritual ends. And I'm just gonna read one more of Pat Parker's poems that um, is one of my favorites. Thank you. I hope, I hope you all are enjoying her work, especially those who may not be familiar with it. I hope so. All right. And so this one has a great musicality rhythm in it. Um, movement in black, movement in black. Can't keep them back, movement in black. They came in ships from a distant land, brought in chains to serve the man. I am the slave that chose to die. I jumped overboard and no one cried. I am the slave sold as stock, walked to and fro on the auction block. They can be caught, they can be taught if you show them how. They're strong as bulls and smarter than cows. I worked in the kitchen, cooked ham and grits, seasoned all dishes with a teaspoon of spit. I worked in the fields, picked plenty of cotton, prayed every night for the crop to be rotten. All slaves weren't treacherous. That's a fact that's true. But those who were, were more than a few. Movement in black, movement in black. Can't keep them back, movement in black. I am the black woman and I have been all over. When the colonists fought the British, I was there. I aided the colonists, I aided the British. I carried notes, stole secrets, guided the men and nobody thought to bother me. I was just a black woman. The British was lost and I lost, but I was there and I kept on moving. I am the black woman and have been all over. I went out west, yeah, the black soldiers had women too. And I settled the land and raised crops and children, but that wasn't all. I hauled freight and carried mail, drank plenty of whiskey, shot a few men too. Books don't say much about what I did, but I was there and I kept on moving. I am the black woman and I have been all over up on platforms and stages talking about freedom, freedom for black folks, freedom for women and the civil war too, carrying messages bandaging bodies, spying and lying. The South lost and I still lost, but I was there and I kept on moving. I am the black woman and I have been all over. I was on the bus with Rosa Parks and the streets with Martin King. I was marching and singing and crying and praying. I was with SNCC and with CORE. I was in Watts when the streets were burning. I was a Panther in Oakland and New York with Now and San Francisco with Gay Liberation, Liberation and DC with Radical Dykes. Yes, I was there and I'm still moving movement in black, movement in back, black, can't keep me black. I am the black woman. I am Bessie Smith singing the blues and all the Bessies that never sang a note. I am the southerner who went north. I'm the northerner who went down home. I'm the teacher in the all black school. I'm the graduate who cannot read. I'm the social worker. I'm the city ghetto. I'm the car hop. I'm Delta town. I'm the junkie with the Jones. I'm the dyke in the bar. I'm the matron at a county jail. I'm the defendant with nothing to say. I'm the woman with eight kids. I'm the woman who didn't have any. I'm the woman who's poor as sin. I'm the woman who's got plenty. I'm the woman who raised white babies and taught my kids to raise themselves. Movement in black, movement in black. Can't keep them back, movement in black. Roll call, shout them out. Phyllis Wheatley, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, Stagecoach Mary, Lucy Prince, Mary Pleasant, Mary McLeod Bethune, Rosa Parks, Coretta King, Fannie Lou Hamer, Marian Anderson, and Billy's and Bessie, Sweet Dinah, Aretha, Natalie, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, Patricia Harris, Angela Davis, Flo Kennedy, Nor Zora Neale Hurston, Nikki Giovanni, June Jordan, Audrey Lord, Edmonia Lewis, and me, and me, and me, and me, and me, and all the names we forgot to say, and all the names we didn't know, and all the names we don't know yet. Movement in Black, movement in Black, can't keep them back, movement in Black. I am the black woman with the child of the sun, the daughter of dark. I carry fire to burn the world. I am water to quench its throat. I am the product of slaves. I am the offspring of queens. I am still the silence. I flow as a stream. I am the black woman. I am a survivor. I am a survivor. I am a survivor. I am a survivor. Movement in black. Yes, Pat Parker. <laughs>
I gotta take some water now. <laughs> so for y'all who don't know Pat Parker now, you know Pat Parker <laughs> and make sure you, you know, get those books or look online. Some of her work is online. I hope y'all enjoyed it. <laughs> Yay for Pat Parker. All right, so I am going to, <laughs> uh, thank you so much y'all. Um, yay. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna do a screen share uh, of, it's basically influenced by my book, um, which uh, Sandy held up earlier. So this is called Say Mirror. And so the only thing you need to know to see this little, it's like a little mini video and you'll hear me reading. So just, just rest my voice a little bit, um, is that my mom was a very well-known African-American model in Harlem before I was born. So this is maybe in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and so the book sort of is a memoir and poetry and deals with growing up with this very big Leo diva personality. Um, and so you'll see it. It's just, it has some photos because there were lots of photos when you grew up with someone who was a model and who very much liked it. And I was the only child. So lots of photos of both of us. Um, so just kind of a, a little mini video and you'll hear me reading some of my poetry, some from the book and some that are tied to the book. All right, so we're gonna try the screen share again. <laughs> Portrait of Mama. I love your cinnamon skin, those full lips stained red. But growing up, I just wanted your arms to wrap me instead. Mama, your self portraits lined all our walls. Do you remember how I tugged at your hem all the time, hoping you would notice that was me by your side? But there's no handbook for children of divas to read, telling us how we should act or how to proceed. All I wanted was to sit on your lap, mama. But you wanted to pull me into the spotlight, all glamor and thrill. I just wanted you to love me, so I learned your runway drill. I smiled and strutted and did as you said. And today, my full lips are always stained red. Praise poem for the journey for my two sons. Praise the therapist who told me 20 years ago, you are not your mother. You do not have to be your mother. Praise the years I spent wanting children, yet so afraid to repeat mama's mistakes. Praise my child self who took care of mama every time she passed out. Praise my adult self who feared the burden of caretaker yet again. Praise my intellect for recognizing my fears and facing them head on. Praise my therapist who let me talk about my fears all those years. Long before I wrapped myself in this mama cloak that fits so well. Praise my mama who did the best with the skills she had. Praise the divas who are sometimes forced to be mamas and the mamas who give birth to divas. Praise them all. Shower them with love and affection. Praise my sons. Praise the first male children born after three successive generations of women praise their lean bodies growing up up each day towards manhood praise the spark in their eyes praise their keen intellect and their giggles that fill my heart praise this calm my child self never knew praise the mothers who love from up close and from afar Praise our children who we tuck in each night and those whose names we wrap in prayer, no matter where they lay their heads down to sleep. Picture perfect. Childhood pictures frame memories. Sad, skinny, light-skinned girl. Straight, stringy hair. Look away, look away, little girl. Photos fill 
walls, tables, rooms, good hair, pink bows, ruffled dresses, mama, show and tell. Look away, look away, little girl. Mama staged each shot, smiles, poses, all forced. Come on, baby, smile big for mama. Look away, look away, little girl. A little girl sits head down on an ugly, faded couch. Knobby knees stuck to plastic. Look away, look away, little girl. Big black and white studio shot, still her favorite. The tears falling down her face. Look away, look away, little girl. No smile to mask her sadness. Only candid shot in the house. Look away, look away, little girl. Apartment 33, Sugar Hill, Harlem, a goodbye poem. I want to remember my bedroom, faded white French provincial furniture, specks of gold, my matching desk, those love letters from my first girlfriend bursting out of an accordion folder. I want to remember our kitchen, thick ebony cast iron pots, grandma's can of grease on the stove, sound of fried chicken crackling, taste of cake batter on my tongue, scent of Nestle's chocolate chip cookies traveling the circumference of our apartment. I want to remember Mama in her cups, alone in her bedroom, Nancy Wilson on the record player, Mama staring out her window facing a brick wall, smell of Salem cigarettes, dim lights, sliver of room through her cracked door. I want to remember our living room, Mama sober, Adults playing bid wits and spades, processed cheese spread, those cute little Vienna sausages, Archie and Edith bickering on the screen, the shiny vinyl spinning and spinning, and me dancing to Ray Charles, hit the road, Jack, while adults laughed and laughed. I want to remember the French doors to my bedroom, the eerie white lady porcelain statue sitting on the shelf in the living room, and Mama rubbing my back, moving that scary white lady from my line of vision every time I woke up with nightmares. I want to remember you, apartment. Diva doll. Baby doll, Barbie doll. Mama was a diva. Mama's baby was a doll. Mama collected dolls, pretty, pink, fluffy, glamorous, porcelain dolls. Mama dressed dolls, dressed me like I was her doll. Fluffy, pretty, powder, pink, show and tell. Baby doll, baby girl, mama's baby girl. Mama loved how dolls looked. Pretty porcelain faces, ruby lips, ebony eyeliner, cinnamon blush. Perfect. Exteriors look pretty, pink, shiny, glossy. Cameras loved mama as much as she loved cameras. Mama shared legacy. Diva doll. Baby doll, mama's living doll. Smile real pretty for the camera, baby. Walk down the runway, baby girl. Follow mama. Follow footsteps. Follow diva. Mama didn't see her baby. Mama saw pink ruffled ponytails. Mama dressed me pretty like her dolls. Everything plastic, coated, covered, perfect show and tell. Mama loved things she could show and tell. Shiny surfaces, exteriors. Kept dolls wrapped in plastic boxes, trophies, show and tell. Mama took pictures. Mama loved studio shots. Mama's baby had to sit for studio shots. Smile pretty baby, smile like mama. You look like a living doll. Pictures don't lie. Mama didn't see eyes peering out. Sad, empty eyes peering out behind porcelain. Mama hung pictures of baby girl, baby doll, diva doll all around the house. Mama hung pictures of herself around the house. Living dolls, pretty pictures filled shelves, walls, empty spaces. Mama's baby doll, mama's mirror. Mama didn't touch. Taffeta ruffles, bubble gum, pink clothes filled closets. Mama covered her baby girl with layers of ruffles, bows, powder, pink fluff. Mama didn't touch. 
kept her in the plastic box. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. All right. So I think I have a little bit of time to read a few poems, some some new poems as well. Thank you so much. Look forward to reading the comments. All right. This is um this sort of goes back to the story I told you about my grandmother calling me a bull dagger. So um, this kind of remembers that rainbow double ethery. Age 18, grandma called me bull dagger. Mama asked, what y'all lesbians do? They call my first girlfriend, Mr. Still, I refused to go back. I stayed out that closet, threw those names away. Say what you want, I am a diva dyke. Damn, I'm strong, words can't hurt. Sting a little, I come from Stonewall. I keep speaking our truth. We be aggressive butch boy, we swag femme with red stilettos, we sexy and black Oxford wingtips. We be a glitter rainbow you can't touch. Um, and this next piece, uh, let me see, is in this book that I highly recommend that was recently published uh, this year. And it's called, it's an anthology of black lesbian thought, Mouths of Rain. It's edited by the brilliant Dr. Breonna Simone Jones. Um, so let me see if I can hold that up. Yes. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a great, wonderful uh, celebration. And Pat Parker's in there, I believe Audre Lorde. So it celebrates both living and ancestor um, black lesbian uh, writers. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And so this poem is my poem that's in there that I'm gonna read now. Um, it's called Obeyed in Pieces for My Ex-Lovers. I am letting go of ex-lovers. I am saying goodbye in between stanzas. Ancient I am is on my Blackberry, deleted. That tear filled message after our fifth breakup. I will love you forever, boo, sad face. A favorite photo of us torn in half an ex-lover cheated with my neighbor's girlfriend. If you see me on the street cross over, I screamed and meant it. I saved my first love poem from my first lover, crumpled in her pocket, damp from a rainstorm. We were 18, she was my first poet. Rain soaked on our first night together. I cried when she handed me that love poem. A woman has always felt like coming home. Every goodbye feels like leaving home. I want to hold on to young me. My only cue was love and deep kisses. I've saved the space in my heart for women's bars that held secret lovers, crushes explored under tables. Even an angry lover who dumped my panties on a conference room table during a staff meeting at my first real job. I'm holding on to all lessons learned. Mama said, don't shit where you eat, child. I wonder what happened to that lover. She only wanted to sex me all summer long and the next woman after her who held on to my every word. Goodbye to the lover I followed 3,000 miles only to learn she saw us as just friends. Thank you to that same woman. She gifted me her room that sweet summer. So long to the PhD who left her lover for me and insisted on no PDAs in public. I'm thankful for the first lover I lived with. She painted a tiny room Navajo white and called it my writer's den. Anita Baker's sweet love was our jam. Um, and so I have to do a praise poem because Sandy talks about <laughs> writing the praise poems and I love to write praise poems and I encourage folks to write praise poems. <laughs> um, I'm all about the praise poem. So this one is called a uh, praise poem for my Leo self. Praise Grandma Pearl who called me a bull dagger when I first came out the closet. Praise all those decades later when Grandma Pearl told me on her deathbed how happy she was I was still with that nice girl. Make sure she keep looking after you, okay baby? Praise those two women who each brought me pleasure on the corner of Perry Street. Praise my nipples, a perfect morsel for each woman that hot summer night. Praise my bold Leo self who didn't care whether passersby saw us. Praise power of pleasure. Praise that angry customs agent in the airport who yelled at my partner and me and our young son all those years ago. No, no, he cannot have two mothers. That is impossible. Praise the look of shock on his face when we pulled out our child's birth certificate with both our names listed as parents. Praise mothers, praise us all, lesbian, queer, bi, trans, questioning women. Praise how we nurture when the rest of the world pushes us down. Praise women who keep rising to the top. Praise my scared little girl self. Praise her memories. Praise mama's cycle of sadness. Praise mamas who sometimes want out of the world and away from their children. Praise mamas whose sadness swallowed a whole childhood. Praise a child's ability to survive. Praise my inner strength. 
Praise the smart, confident person that breathes in my skin. Love her when she's bold and then again when she's scared. Praise all the marches I've been in. Praise the calls for justice for queer bodies and black boys and girls everywhere. Praise all the people that will continue to march for justice when I can't anymore. Praise my weary feet. Let them dance tonight, remembering all that love, all that love. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that I almost always try to read at least one or two poems that thank you, um, that talks about raising my sons um, who are definitely you know, sort of the pride of my wife and I. Um, but it's hard raising um, young black boys, black men here in this country sometimes. So I um, thought about them when I wrote this poem. We beautiful black boys. And this is written after We Real Cool by Gwendolyn Brooks. And I know a lot of y'all know that poem. We beautiful black boys. We got so much poise. We look like grown men. We keep coming to an early end. We got mamas who keep mourning. We just want to see a new morning. We smart and get good grades. We keep getting so much shade. We rise early and study hard. We still got cops asking for ID cards. We wear hoodies and travel with friends. We tired of being seen through same old lens. We want history to stop rewinding, repeating. We don't want to be a part of senseless beatings. We need our brilliance to be widespread. We got to keep moving ahead. I'm just going to do a few more. <laughs> Thank y'all. Um, the next one is called Ethery for Black Women. Black women. We be trying to hold worlds on our backs and our hearts without fail. Some days we fail at perfection. Black girl magic is a mass. We pull off when night comes. Alone in our world, weight off our backs. We exhale, a lone heart. We whisper in wet pillows, wet with our tears, our untold secrets. We breathe without our mask. We sit still in our silence. Some nights we float on crescent moons, black girl magic shining under stars. We gather our pieces before daylight. Um, and this is a pride poem. Um, I probably wrote this doing maybe a pride, uh, you know, one, one of my pride month readings or writings. Um, pride poem, or why I write my story. I write my story so a woman somewhere knows that she can love another woman and still live. I scream my story because once I too was scared of what other folks would think. If it, they found out it was a woman's touch I craved. In a room full of strangers, I take the mic and reminisce about a woman I loved who once broke my heart because I want another woman to know I'm still here. I repeat the names folks have called me, Dyke, Bulldagger, Lezzy, because those names have never defined me. Sometimes I cry when I say the names of women who were killed just for loving their reflection like Sakia Gunn. Each night, it is a woman I come home to and every morning I wake to sound of a woman's voice. After all these years, it is still a woman who centers me. Um, do I have time for two more? You guys tell me. Yes, two more? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, all right, so this poem I wrote um, fairly recently. I was thinking about sort of my future self and if I didn't remember kind of like, you know, what was happening, what would I say, right? So this is also like a prompt, I guess, right? What would you say to your future self? Dear future self, if I should ever forget you, this is my love note to you. You were loved. You were somebody's lover. You were loving. You held all hearts of all the women you loved somewhere deep in your generous heart. You were heartbroken. You were heartbreaker too, girl. Sometimes you were heartache. You, your heart never grew heavy though. I remember that about you. You were silly. You were giggles. You were somebody's mama. You always wanted to be a mama. Mama was the greatest title you ever had. You were jealous as fuck. You were selfish. You were sad. You held other folks' sadness, especially mama's sadness. You buried hers deep in your heart. You were swag, girl. Leo charm and confidence. Couldn't nobody crack you up like yourself. You were cute and you were vain. You wore lipstick under your mask during the pandemic. Of course, you were cute and you were vain. You loved your family. Your lover loved you for decades. Sometimes you would ask yourself, how oh, I get so lucky, girl? You loved people. You were at home on a stage or in front of a mic, sitting with community in a circle or talking one-on-one -on -one with a friend for hours on end in a coffee shop. You were a poet. You are a poet. This is your love poem to yourself, Jay. And I'm just gonna do one more. Actually, I think I'm gonna do 
um, this is sort of a poem that I like to read at a lot of my readings. Um, it's from my book and it's the last poem in the book. And it's really an offering to anyone who's going through a difficult time. If you know someone who is uh, going through a difficult time, so this poem is for you. What to say to a friend who wants to give up. Say, I love you, even when you can't love yourself. Say, please, please, not today. Say too much life unlived. Say mirror, say beautiful. Say this arm, say take this arm. Say grab, say hold, say let tears fall. Say tears heal, say forgive your mama. Say she did the best she could. Say tomorrow, say sleep, say split seconds. Say split seconds, split the seconds. Say let the seconds turn into days. Say today, say tomorrow, say sun, say warm, say skin, say warm skin, say sunlight, say new, de new day, say breathe, say inhale, say exhale, say not today, baby girl, say so much life to live, say love, say I love you, say hold on, hold on to love. Thank you so much, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. Here is just what I want to say before I have everybody praise you in a moment. What I love about you, JP, unpologetic poet, unpologetic mama, unpologetic diva, you know, unpologetic daughter, unpologetic, you know, uh, uh, lifter of voices unapologetic praise for the living and praise for the dead, unapologetic lesbian, unapologetic woman, unapologetic lover of women. I just, I, I can't thank you enough. And would everybody unmute and send your praise right now to JP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous, fabulous. Uh, thank you guys so much. That was so much fun. I had a great time. <laughs> JP's yes. card. Yes. <laughs> there it is, number 34. And Pat Parker, number 28. I should write these things down. JP's book is Say, Mirror, Poems and Histories. And if you want to reconnect with the praise poems and also um, poems where she also gives her shout outs to Pat Parker and Audre Lorde, those are contained in here too, as well as many of the photographs that you saw in the slideshow um, today in the poems praising her mother and the diva within. Um, the book is Samir Operating System Press. And again, uh, just to show you those original collections of Pat Parker's because they're, they're so significant in the history Movement in Black, what, a, what an amazing thing to get to hear Movement in Black. Thank you for reading that today, as well as Jonestown and other madness. I love that line, come, come to you strong. And boy, did you come to us strong, sharing the work of Pat Parker and your own extraordinary poetry. And uh, I'm, Super grateful to Headmistress Press for putting me in a room with you that that one fine night in Washington D.C. a few years ago, and I always am astonished, amazed, and send all the praise when I can be in your presence. Thank you, dear, dear sister. Ah, uh, thank you, today. thank you so much. It was beautiful, y'all. Thank you. So good to be here. Looking forward to the open mic. <laughs> well, for everybody who appreciates what Headmistress Press continues to do to bring writers like J.P. Howard and elevating the voices of our literary sisters in legacy like Pat Parker to the virtual stage. Well, why not purchase one, two, or all sets with the exception of that one rare one that is out of print now, 
but Yeva owns it. I always like to say Yeva's got it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> of the lesbian poet trading card series. You know, pairing a card, setting, setting it up with books from the authors of the cards, make fantastic, unique gifts to your favorite lesbians, including yourself. Gift yourself something. Gift yourself some books that really celebrate your lives. I mean, that's what I loved about hearing your work today was JP was, you know, you know, hearing stories I knew and stories I didn't know come together um, in your just incredible voice. Well, anytime is the grand time to support Headmistress Press, the press that really supports you uh, in bringing the voices of LGBTQ writers into print. So head on over to Headmistress Press website to purchase anything. And now we got the beauty of our open mic. Um, again, sending out more praise and love to our open mic poets that are gonna share their work with us. And first today we have Sarah Youngblood Gregory. Sarah Youngblood Gregory is a lesbian poet and culture writer. She serves on the board of the Lesbian Literary and Arts Journal, Sinister Wisdom, the publisher of the complete works of Pat Parker, among many other um, incredible titles that you should have in, that I recommend that you have. I, I'm not a should person. I recommend that you add to your libraries. Sarah holds a BA in gender studies and literature and her work explores kink, femininity, disability and queerness. Her work has been published or is forthcoming in the Rumpus, the Tahoma Literary Review, Queen, Mobs and Jakar Press, as well as the Adroit Journal. Would you please welcome Sarah Youngblood Gregory. Hi, can you hear me? You're good. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, JP. That was a really, really beautiful reading and I'm so pleased to be here amongst some really, really great company. Um, so I'm going to read maybe two poems. I'm gonna see how the timing goes. The first one is called Medusa Dark Blue. My girlfriend and my girlfriend kiss secondhand from her lips to my lips to her lips to mine, then the other to mine then back, then restart. If you can't imagine what I do with my girlfriend and my girlfriend, that's the point. My lovers gather in the temple, the temple underwater where Medusa is raped. Medusa's pussy turns explosion, the smell of fish frying. I break up with my girlfriend and I stay with my girlfriend. Perverts in the water, pyros in the sea, there are more women than my girlfriend and my former girlfriend, the way we manage to share one mouth. I show up late to the underwater temple. My lovers there are ugly. I am there, ugly. The knife slips through the bucket. The knife guts the fish. Guts explode the world. What is ugly defiles. I don't compare myself to Medusa when Medusa has a cock whose clothes make up my bed, whose teeth my mouth. On the end of the line, dark blue. There is heavy breathing. Am I still angry? The cock is the mangrove snake. The mouth is the mouth. My body is never the temple. My girlfriend and my former girlfriend, me and my lovers, the uglies, we are climbing the trees. From up in the trees, the uglies are looking down years ago saying, don't touch the ground. We show up early and kill what doesn't suit. On the shoreline, there is a snake for every mouth. There is a bucket for every hole, the second hand, the knife, the explosion, Medusa still angry and the smell of what this time doesn't get away. I think, do I have time for one more? Okay, this is gonna be a shorter one. This is called August. It was August, long and heavy, crammed into a house of three barely women, blowing off steam and into my mouth, a jay screaming, forget. It was years of fire, unelected fire, electric under the sky. I lay in the arms of barely talking, 
of burning and watching memory. Memory revise us, make a cup out of water. Let us be the last to know. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Sarah. Great to have you here with us today. I look forward to hearing more of your work soon. And thanks for your work with Sinister Wisdom, keeping, thanks. you know, keeping the voices alive, keeping the voices vibrant, you know, keeping them in print. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Fantastic poems. Mm, wow. Well, next we move on to Alana Dykewoman. I'm so excited to hear your work today. And here is Alana's formal biography. <laughs> Alana Dykewoman is a longtime social justice activist, editor, and teacher living in Oakland, California. She's published eight award-winning books foregrounding lesbian heroism, including her Lambda-winning book, Beyond the Pale. And she received the 2018 Lee Lynch Classic Award from Golden Crown for her first novel, River Finger Woman, Women. Her most recent poetry collection, What Can I Ask?, is among the sapphic classics in the Sinister Wisdom series. Sinister Wisdom has also recently published a special issue, Alana, co-edited with Judith Katz to be a Jewish dyke in the 21st century. Currently, she's working on a full-length play about lesbian love, dementia, the right to die, caretaking, and community, honoring her late spouse, Susan Levenkind. She is grateful for all these years of lesbian interconnection. And I am truly grateful to be in your presence today um, for your extraordinary work that we get to hear today. And, and thank you for, just thank you for all of your work over the decades. Thank you, Sandy. I, um, I really appreciate your introduction and I appreciate Headmistress Press and I am glad to be invited um, today to, to read. Okay, so for me, the 21st century has been very difficult and full of opportunities to find new dimensions in life and death. Many of my cohort in lesbian community have died my deepest writing colleagues, two ex-lovers, in 2015, my mother, and in late 2016, my partner, Susan, after seeing her through three years of progressive dementia. You would think that grief would make me gloomy, and it has sometimes for years. But as my own life claims me with its challenges and loving friendships, I find myself almost happy and re-engaged with the world in all its violences and beauties. So these are poems I've written this year. A full course load. Death is the school and all the teachers in it. Isn't that enough to say? I am too tired to copy the class lists, the syllabi, the sections in different locations on death's vast campus. Though I've been at it more than 50 years, used to fall asleep in my 8 a.m. class of Attic Greek language no one alive exactly speaks. Dead tongues, room 205. See what I mean? No one knows what the course reading will be or where until death summons you to her office, says, now look again at your grandmother's burns, your mother's oxygen, your lover's seizures. What did you learn? What did I learn? Death hurts, but 
Like a hamster in a dog's mouth, you pass out. That's just the basic course, death scoffs. A student pokes her head in. Genocide 610? Past, present, and future death remembers all her offerings. End of the quad, fourth floor, colonial building. You will recognize the door. She returns to me, our oral examination. Okay, here's what I understood first. What you give thinking, damn, I'm generous. Gee, I'm good. Aren't my gifts just fine? You find turned inside out humbled for a lifetime because off the cuff close to glib you gave your grandmother roses your mother a slice of tongue your lover that one last trip humbled death says that's good enough i'll pass you on to level seven how many levels three dozen or ninety hundred and eleven in this cluster You've seen death grin, haven't you? Her face is in the papers, the camps, rising ethers form her skeleton above streets of corpses and in cartoons. You reach for her bony fingers and find instead the schedule for next semester. This next one is called Butch's Stand in My Doorway and Cry. Butch's Stand in My Doorway and Cry, threshold of last resort for those who've lost, whom I have lost in different forms. They say, I never cry. I only cry in the car, in the woods, the bathroom. They believe they are safe with only a nod for acknowledgement. I know when to keep my mouth shut, accept all offerings. It's the grotto of the butch Madonna. She was another Jew who knew loss. And I, I will never now disparage faith. And this last one, um, is a, one of the things in which I am, poems in which I am uh, grappling with my own mortality. It's called Hummingbird Heart. The smallest is two inches. Her name is B, the name someone gave her. The largest is five. Their wings tread air at frequencies we hear if, for instance, they appear in the bottle brush or honeysuckle or near an open window feeding chicks. Some surprise live up to 12 years, drawing breath as much as 250 times while you read this, hearts going over a thousand beats a minute. Lately, I have considered my own heart going too fast, its beats uncoupled, skipping as if it were this kind of bird, black chinned, Anna's calliope, but rusty, wheezing out of tune, trying to rest or moving to some breeze only it can hear deep in my chest, telling me. No nectar left. And still in my driveway, red and orange flowers bloom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're muted. You're muted, Sandy. Oh, I got it. I love that final poem for today. And thank you with, with, that, with that opening, the hummingbirds, but also that line for me, 
call, you know, colonial building, you will recognize the door. Um, but every every poem, the mark of 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 your keen insight and eye that you've been developing through through time. And thank you very much for your extraordinary voice sharing today, but that you've shared four decades. Uh, it's really quite an honor to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Honored to be here. Hmm. Well, our next reader, I am so happy to introduce Mary Oishi to all of you. Mary Oishi is the current poet laureate of Albuquerque, New Mexico and is the author of Spirit Birds, They Told Me, and the co-author of Rock, Paper, Scissors, which was a finalist for the 2018 New Mexico, Arizona Book Award. Mary's work has been published in numerous reviews and anthologies and in translation, including in 12 Poetas, Antologia de Nuevos Poetas Estaduanidenses, a project of the Mexican Ministry of Culture. Awishi is a public radio personality in the Southwest and served 17 years as the lead facilitator for an LGBT youth group and her lifelong activism has grown out of being a queer Asian American raised by fundamentalist white supremacists in rural Pennsylvania. Will you please join me in welcoming Mary Oishi. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with such wonderful poets. This first poem I wrote in my late teens or perhaps the first half of my 20th year before I was actually with a woman but it's about being in the closet. It's called yeast. My soul is an expanding molecule, but I am infinitely self-disciplined. The world cannot see this swell or the effort to contain it. So refined my sacrifice and so complete my martyrdom, they are totally invisible. Yet I must tend them with such diligence they are the only things I see. Never mind my pretense, I only mouth my lines. My eye is steady, fastened inward, the devoted doorman. What is it I do not trust or whom? And why suppress the yeast of passion with such compulsion that it becomes a passion of itself? Because the product, if allowed to grow, would be so different, so deviant, my race would disallow me. And yet that force unleashed is what I truly am. Can the surge within me be forever reigned? Or will the bearing down provide the very pressure to fuel the bursting forth, a blossoming of power and magnitude I shudder to imagine. And this one is called Ask Alice. I remember through the looking, I remember reading through the looking glass with a friend, my first female lover. We both liked Vonnegut and Lewis Carroll. Our favorite saying was the Red Queen quotation when she gave Alice a dry biscuit. Thirst quenched, I hope. Tail end hippies in the late 70s, trying out a new kind of love. She taught me how to kiss. And I knew from the very first one, no dry biscuits here. And this poem um, I read at the Albuquerque Women's March the day after the inauguration in 2017. And um, I felt like it was medicine, <laughs> even though I had written it years before then. 
Women, when we rise, we rise heaving, panting, pushing, screaming, like Big Bang birthing when we rise. Women, when we rise, we rise against pain, through pain, through pain, through more pain than one body can stand, it seems. Women, when we rise, it's never just one resurrection. It's always bringing more life with it, pulling the whole underworld along its bursting tombs into seedlings and springtime and singing tomorrows when we rise. Women, when we rise, truth mountains shadow darken for centuries, burst watermelon and high lit ribs, plain as day for a hundred miles when we rise. Women, when we rise, secrets cry out from crevices, sulfured springs transform to sparkling. What once was poison now is fuel for still more rising when we rise. Women, when we rise, there is no wind can take us down, tethered as we are to moon and mystery. Women, when we rise, all else is trifled, all the foulest deeds of greed and war, all fears that spawn them gone when women find their power. Women, when we rise, we rise together out of bones unnamed and cries forgotten, bonded to ourselves like witch to stake, like slave to chain, like Hiroshima vapor to the stone, like Juarez blood to desert sand. But when we rise, we bring them every soul from the first mother forward and goddess breath will roar from us forever when we rise. Women, when we rise, we must not, cannot, will not be put down again. When women rise, when women, women rise. Ooh. Yes. What once was poison is more fuel for rising. What a line from your poem, Mary. And the poem just, folks, is in Spirit Birds They Told Me, Women When We Rise. Thank you so, so much. I'll be I'll be giving a little shout out for an event that you're doing tomorrow at the end of the program. <laughs> well, our final reader for today, what, uh, how, much, how much praise could we give everyone here today? Talk about praise. I mean, praise for the generations of women that we've gotten to hear today, uh, the ones speaking voices and the ones carrying voices forward. Uh, uh, from the past into the future. Our final poet today is uh, really, I, I always love it when I'm in the room with Yeva Johnson and, 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 and her spirit and energy. And uh, great to have you as our final voice this afternoon. Yeva Johnson is a Pushcart Prize nominated poet, musician, and physician whose work appears or is forthcoming in the Bellingham Review, Genre Urban Arts, House Anthology, number two, Sinister Wisdom, of course, and Yamase and elsewhere. She explores interlocking caste systems and possibilities for human coexistence in our biosphere. Yeva is a past Show Us Your Spines, Artist in Residence, from Radar Productions, the San Francisco Public Library, and the winner of the 2020 Mostly Water Art and Poetry Splash Contest. A poet in the uh, QT Park for show, a small and sustaining San Francisco Bay Area Artist Collective would you please all welcome Yeva Johnson. Thank you so much, Sandy. I am completely honored and grateful to be here. And I just had to be, I know Lisa knows to be uh, 
uh, Pat Parker I love and just found out about her recently. So I have two poems, one is short and one is longer. And I usually do my poems with a little music before and after. So I think it'll just fit into what we have to do. <laughs> Poetic Sisters. Her last poem slips away. My fingertips close the book of complete works and I miss her. I yearn for her despite not yet having put her book in its rightful place on my shelf. So when I turn to my other sister outsider, I can't yet give myself up to Audrey because Pat Parker beckons me still with her innards. As I had to with June Jordan, I learn that I must live without her. All that's left are Pat's pages. After I recover my more even keeled black lesbian, mother, pacifist, Jewish, feminist, physician, self, then I can drink Audrey in. Drink deep but slow, like sampling a fine wine. Lord caught me up completely in the poem for Martha. I'm hooked, sinking and swimming, reading and rejoicing and mourning simultaneously. Oh, sister outsiders, would that I had seen you alive. And this is, this is the long one. Like the forgotten anonymous, after Muriel Rukeyser's The Life of Poetry and For My Chosen Families. I sing to you of loneliness, curiosity, my ugly beauty, the veils which W.E.B. Du Bois revealed to me and which I pull back and pull back and pull back, crying out for poets, for people, for sibling outsiders, for the end to dichotomous thinking and the disentanglement of the strands of interlocking caste hierarchies and for the dissolution of said hierarchies so that the entire African diaspora can heal for sure. I sing to you because procrastination and poetry do not make a pretty picture, because I live on one bread loaf or another, on the scent of song at the Bird and Beckett, and on the nourishment of Angela Bowen, Audre Lorde, Gladys Bentley, June Jordan, Lorraine Hansberry, Lucille Clifton, Nina Simone, Pat Parker, and Eves at the beat. I touch my face, feel my smile through my cheek, and peer far into the future where the dust of my skeleton has scattered the four winds and only part of my skull remains rattling around some grotto, playing out my last rhythms with a melody of love's lavender laments that whistle through sphenoid sinuses on a breeze which never cooled the passion that had kept my body alive. Exactly how long after 1619 and before the mid 1700s, some of my ancestors arrived on this continent, I do not know, but no matter, I was born primed for survival. I sang to you of truth and beauty, love, friendship, and death, because eventually my well ran dry, my hedgebrook trickled out, my lakes turned to rolling meadows in virtual valleys, my snow-capped peaks poked bare sun metal tips to the sky's radar productions, my ocean tide did not rise high enough to carry me on the sea of life. I sang to you because a mind is a terrible thing to waste, and BIPOC, Jewish, music, cutie pop, artistic and writing community sang back in a symphonic tapestry that formed the village that raised me. I sang to you because the Ghost Lines Collective embodied infinite love which overflowed when master poets adored each other in a crown reading of poem after poem, which then expanded into wave after wave, which carried me with them so my tongue could be free to unleash my voz sin tinta. 
Anyone who knows me knows I don't speak Spanglish, mas eu falo portuñol, yo hablo espantugues, and I'm learning Ashalot. Like a middle-aged Hansel or Gretel, I tap, tap, tapped in and collected refrains one by one to follow a path back to myself, root slam. I sang to you because I couldn't ask you to remember me. I was rooted and it was written that I was destined to be forgotten. So I asked you to remember a rat radical feminism where every gender shines true, to remember every color of the human rainbow is sacred, to remember sentient beings are beings, not objects, because I had hoped that you would act accordingly. This is what love means. I will sing to you of atavistic wisdom and the last poet because I drift as dust and sprinkle the dreams of future offspring with the warning, beware of the dog, and the alley cat. Respect the voices of our nation's arts and always heed la palabra musical. I know not what Yorick said, but hark, my teeth are clacking and it's time to get lit at this rainbow riding school where the headmistress presses you to produce new poems. I will sing to you because I spent a lifetime seeking to hear my name. I would see it resounding only after I became a lonely nomadic poet pushed by a pandemic into an electronic sea of Zoom rooms to hear waves of Yeva, Yeva, Yeva echo back to me in the chat, the magic box that allowed me to teach you how to say my name. Say it now because it's soon to be forgotten. I will sing to you of poets living and dead who can sing in real life on the page or across the web because you will need this sinister wisdom. I will sing to you because I must release this ridiculous rage, my black feminist, queer woman, Jewish, fat, disabled musician, physician, poet self knows by heart because before I even started, I could never be finished. I sing because lights out. Thank you. Oh, thank you for all that singing, all that music, and saying all our names, saying all the names of saying all the names. So many names got brought forth today. And let me take a moment to thank all of our open mic readers by saying their names who read in the open mic today. We first heard from Sarah Youngblood Gregory, Alana Dyke Woman, Mary Oishi, and of course, Yeva, Yeva, Yeva Johnson closed out the open mic and we began today's quite extraordinary gathering for the collectibles with the uh, ever praiseworthy J.P. Howard reading again, card number 34, reading the poems as well as her own of the poet Pat Parker, card number 28. Reminder, JP's collection is Say Mirror. And if you all enjoyed our reading today, I'll hope you'll all join us next month on Saturday, June 19th, otherwise known as Juneteenth for the dynamic Judith Barrington, card number 66. That's a good number. Sharing the work of, oh, I got to hear Janice Gould read once, and it was an amazing, amazing reading. The work of Janice Gould. That is Saturday, June 19th, noon Pacific. 3 p.m. 
Eastern. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, fabulous. Oh. fabulous, fabulous. Uh, thank you guys so much. That was so much fun. I had a great time. <laughs>